Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good, good. My name's Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I saw a lot of new faces uh, today. Uh, in that seat back pocket in front of you, uh, there's a care card. Uh, it would be a huge favor to us uh, if you would fill that care card out. Uh, maybe you've got prayer requests. Uh, maybe you're uh, talk, thinking about baptism. Um, I can tell you this, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're in Christ and you've not been baptized, that is your next step, period, is baptism. And we take that very seriously here uh, at Hendersonville Church. Or maybe you wanna serve. Uh, we've got a lot of opportunities for people who are called of God uh, to serve. Maybe it's in the kids' ministry. Uh, maybe it's with the greeters. Maybe it's, it's something, I'm not sure. But, but fill that out. And either Ryan Sisney or myself, the two elders here at Hendersonville Church, we'll give you a call uh, at some point this week and, and walk through anything uh, you may have. I wanna make you aware of some upcoming things here at Hendersonville Church. Um, first off, every Monday, 5.30. Every Monday, 5.30, unless we tell you otherwise, uh, we, we assemble here to pray. Uh, we, we pray for various things. We pray for the care cards. Uh, we pray, well, not the care cards themselves. They're fine. The requests that are on the care cards. Um, but we pray for, for our nation, our leaders, for our church. Um, we, we, just, we just pray. We go into a time of prayer. Uh, there are people who've come here that want to be prayed over. Um, so that's every Monday at 5.30. Um, August 18th, this Thursday at 6.30, uh, Ryan and I have asked Dr. Donna Gibbs to come in here and give a, a workshop, an intensive, uh, for lack of a better word, on marriage. So here's the deal. If you're married, if you ever plan to be married, or you ever plan to do life with married people, uh, you would do yourself a huge favor to be here. Um, because it's, there's, I've heard this before. There's some amazing practical truth that's going to be shared uh, this Thursday evening at 6.30. You don't want to miss it. And then August 25th, um, that's a week uh, from this Thursday, our men's and women's groups launch again for another semester, roughly 13 weeks. Uh, I am super excited. Um, that, that's honestly, that, that is what's growing into the backbone of Hendersonville Church. Um, and I mean, those of you who have been coming, you know how God has just chosen his providence and his sovereignty uh, to move through these men's and women's group and to watch addictions change, to watch people go into rehab, to watch marriages be reconciled. It's been incredible to watch people come to Christ. It's been, it's been amazing on what God's done. Um, you know, if you wanna know how you can help Hendersonville Church, show up. Because here's the thing. If you're in Christ, if you're in Christ, you're a member of the body. Whether you, whether you want to, uh, to like that or not, the scriptures are clear. If you are in Christ, you're a member of his body. And Paul uses a beautiful analogy of the body to say if the foot doesn't wanna go this way, the foot's not only hurting itself, it's hurting the rest of the body. So again, we are supposed to build up and edify the body of Christ. It's a beautiful thing. And then on August 29th, so right after our prayer group meets, we're gonna go into what's called biblical foundations where we're gonna start unpacking the beautiful and glorious doctrines that are found throughout the word of God. And it's been amazing to see how people are coming to Ryan and me. And they're saying, man, for the first time ever, I'm reading the scriptures. I'm not just listening to some person one hour a week or listening to a podcast or listening to some other flashy preacher. I'm actually jumping into the word of God myself. That's how he speaks to you. Folks, that's how God speaks to you, is through his word. And I wanna put these two verses of scripture up on the screen that we do, and we're gonna do it a lot of Sundays because it's important. The writer of Hebrews, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, here's the remarkable thing. A lot of people don't play or recite the very next verse. The very next verse says this, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God doesn't mince words. God's wrath is beautiful. His holiness is amazing. It's immeasurable. It's unsearchable. We are saved into a process of sanctification. And again, when Paul's writing to young Timothy, he says all scriptures breathed out by God. 
and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And let's just acknowledge the tension in the room. No one likes to hear reproof, do they? No one better reproof me. No one wants to hear correction, do they? No one better correct me. Listen, God doesn't mince words, y'all. He doesn't. Training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If you're in here today and you think the gospel's a fire insurance policy and you think you're just saved to escape hell, I would highly encourage you, one, to fill out that care card and two, to take Paul's advice to the church in Philippi and work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. We are not just saved to escape hell. We are saved unto good works. Listen, I wanna make sure I'm clear. Works do not lead to our salvation. Works are an evidence of our salvation. Jesus could not have been any more clear about that. And it's a big mistake to think that. Our Christian walk is to cover the entirety of our life, 168 hours a week, period, not just in here. And so please jump into the word of God. Please pray about being here on Thursday nights and Monday nights. But Nathan, I'm busy, okay? All right, Nathan, gas is too expensive, okay? You, you, get, you got enough money to go out to eat dinner? What's important? Where are your priorities? Where are your priorities? Again, man, oh man, he's starting out fired up. He's not even gotten to Ephesians yet. I get it. I've been super convicted by this because I'm watching people who've been going to church for 40 and 50 years finally jump into the word of God for themselves and to know what God says. And they come to me like, man, this is amazing. And by the way, everybody that preaches the word of God, you better run it all through scripture, including me. Every last word of it. Now, the past several weeks, let's just acknowledge attention, from Ephesians 4.17 to Ephesians 6.9, we're going to cover uh, the last uh, verses 5 through 9 today of Ephesians 6, are incredibly convicting. And to just, just to study them in and of themselves, one could argue, man, this is legalistic. Man, this is, this is commanding too much of us. And that is why Paul wrote to the Ephesians church, chapter 1, two, three, four, five, and six, a letter meant to be read in its entirety. And we're gonna talk about that a lot next week because unless you sit in chapter one, we spent five weeks on one sentence in chapter one. Five weeks on one sentence in chapter one because it's who we are in Christ. And unless you sit in that, you can't walk it out. You've got to sit in who you are in Christ to be able to walk it out. And I wanna talk about grace for a moment. Because a lot of people come to say, man, Nathan, I'm not, I'm not the husband I should be. I'm not the wife I should be. I'm not the parent I should be. Man, this is super convicting. Listen, I get it. I'm not the husband I should be. I'm not the father I should be. Trust me, I cry tears when I prepare this message. And this one today is no different because we're gonna talk about employees and employers in a minute. But I wanna talk about grace for a moment. Listen to what Paul says to the church in Rome. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And listen to what he says and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Folks, if you're in Christ, you're redeemed. When God looks at you, he doesn't see who you are. He sees his son's righteousness. You've got to know that truth. In the first verse of chapter eight, he says this. There is therefore now just a little bit of condemnation for those who are in Christ. No, no. There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. None, zero. When Jesus said, it is finished, the war is over. We won. It's over. On my best day outside the blood of Christ, listen, I'm filthy rags. But when I'm in Christ, listen, there's nothing I do to make God love me any more or any less. It was done at the cross of Calvary. You've got to know that truth. And so today we're gonna, we're gonna talk about, Paul talks about uh, uh, slaves and, and, and masters today. And there's, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, discussion about this verse of scripture. And I wanna, I wanna set the context first so that we're crystal clear on the word of God. But it's really extended into employees and employers. And let's just face it, the struggle's real with employees and employers employees want fewer hours. They want more vacation. They want more benefits. They want more pay. Employers want increased profits. Both sides, 
Both sides want more government control, but pay less taxes. Both sides. And the problem is it's grown into a mess. And here's the thing, folks. It's because our problems are never political. Uh, they're, they're never social. They're never economic. Folks, they're spiritual. There's this problem of sin and greed. And that's what has started all of this. And I'm just gonna say it, and a lot of people get offended when I say this. The more I fight for my individual privileges and freedoms, the less I look like Jesus. The more I fight for my individual freedoms and privileges, the less I look like Jesus. And we're gonna learn that today. And when things don't go our way, we wanna blame Satan for everything. And it's something that church leaders must be very cautious of to not just blame things, oh, well, Satan's just attacking us. No, God may be judging us. And so the problem is our flesh. Our flesh wants it. Our flesh wants what we want. Our flesh wants to feel what we want to feel, what we think we feel. The problem is that's not truth. This is. This is truth, and it is the only truth, and there is nothing but the truth. This. And we've got to make sure we're clear on that. Now, some people want to criticize Christianity because in the Old and New Testament, there is not a specific condemnation of slavery. Okay, so I want to address that contextually because context is everything with reading the New Testament. It is absolutely everything. First off, by the time Jesus enters the scene, by the time Paul wrote these letters, there were massive reforms to where honestly, it was almost impossible socially to distinguish between a slave or a bond servant and a master. It was almost impossible to distinguish between the two. Neither party felt the practice was evil. Again, it was nothing like the diabolical and demonic practices that were going on in the United States in the 19th century. Now, was that still being practiced? Yes, but there were many people that would sell themselves into slavery because there were very few people above the age of 30 that were still bond servants. They would be able to buy their way to have Roman citizenship. And so it's, it's necessary that we understand that. Plus, to have attacked the, the, the practice, the social practice of slavery would have honestly been the, to the demise of both parties at that time. And then lastly, and we're gonna learn this today, <laughs> the radical sisterhood and brotherhood that the gospel proclaims back in Ephesians 3 and 4 and in Galatians, listen, it started to build the foundation to end slavery anyway. And that's what we've got to understand. And Paul's letters echo this. In Galatians 3.28, he says this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Would have been so countercultural when he said that. There is neither slave nor free. They would have been like, what? There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Even when Paul, some of you may know the book Philemon. Well, Philemon was a wealthy Christ follower who owned, who had slaves. He did. And again, we've got to make sure context is key. It is nothing like the slave trade that was going on in the 19th century. But Philemon had, had a slave, and his name was Onesimus. And inevitably, Onesimus had left Philemon wrongly. He ended up in Rome, where Paul was in prison. Paul met him through the sovereignty of God. Onesimus came to Christ, okay? The first concern of Onesimus was to repent of his sin against Philemon. And Paul's first concern with Onesimus that he be reconciled back to his brother. So Paul wants him to go all the way back to Colossae where Philemon lived. That's a huge testament to us as Christ followers. Listen, God hates disunity in the church. I can't say that clear. From Proverbs to all in the New Testament, God cannot stand those who sow discord in his bride. And Paul knew he wanted Onesimus so bad. You can read the book of Philemon to get it contextually, but he knew he had to be reconciled back to Philemon. And so he writes to Philemon, he sends a letter to him, and that's what's in our canon. It's amazing how God works. And so he's telling him what to do. And then listen what he says in verse 16, talking about Onesimus. He's no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and and in the Lord. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. Because I'm telling you, when we start talking about in the flesh and in the Lord, folks, we are one. 
We are one in Christ Jesus, and we've got to understand that. And again, New Testament teaching does not focus on reforming human systems. It doesn't. People ask me all the time, hey, you know, because of this social issue or this economic issue or this political issue, what are you preaching? Oh, it's real simple. Jesus Christ, him crucified. It's real simple. I'll have nothing to do with that. Nothing. And here's the reason why. Because this doesn't. From Genesis to Revelation, it is about the person and work of Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is truth. And so we've got to understand that the New Testament, our problems are not political. They're not social. They're not economic. They are spiritual. It is demonic influence. And we're going to talk about that next week. But remember that command in 521 about three weeks ago of mutual submission. So our text today, I'm finally getting to it, is verses five through nine of chapter six. And so Paul starts out talking to bond servants. And I want to read the whole thing at first, what he says to the bond servants. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Rendering service with a good will, as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. And so what this does is puts us on a journey. Because here's the thing, I would venture to say there are a lot of people in here that, that actually have a job, like a job where you have to go to and, and you get a paycheck from it. That's what I mean by that, okay? And so this gives a lot of employees some really, really good practical application. And so there's four things that that passage of scripture tell us about an employee. Number one, I must obey and respect my employer, period. And again, I wanna, I wanna share some of my life before I came to Christ, before I got called to ministry. But in six, verse part of six, five, it says, bond servants, obey your earthly masters, masters with fear and trembling. He carries the same type of concept with wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church he gave himself up for. Parents, don't provoke your kids to anger. Kids, obey your parents. These are all non-conditional commands. And so the obligation of the Christ follower is to please the Lord by faithfully obeying and uh, respecting his boss, period. And it's got nothing to do with your boss. You're doing it for the Lord. And this fear and trembling, it doesn't, it's not a shaking in boots and we'll talk about employers in a second, lording over their employees, because Paul gets to that. But it doesn't, it's, it's, a, it's a respect. It's a positional respect that God has put in place. And this applies to the government. This applies to teachers. This applies to any type of authority God has placed over you. And we're going to talk about that here in just a moment. Again, as long as your boss is not asking you to do something unethical, immoral, illegal, or unbiblical, you obey her or him. It's that simple. And I get it, this isn't popular, but Paul's not mincing words here. And here's the thing, here's why this was so important. Again, context is key. Because slaves typically knew all the affairs of their owners. It, again, it was nothing like the 19th century America, nothing. It was almost impossible to distinguish between slaves and masters in the Roman Empire. And so they typically knew it all. And, and again, it was easy for them to get contempt to say, well, I could do this better. And man, I, this spoke to me because man, I'm actually praying, do I need to go back to some of my previous bosses and repent? Because I didn't respect them. And I thought I was making them all the money. And I thought I was doing it all. And I was like, man, if I ever, if I ever get to own this place, look out, I'm gonna clean house. That's, that's literally what I thought. And I had this contempt and and, and, and man, it was, I know I'm better than smarter and smarter than, than these people who are, who are over me, whether it's your boss or supervisor or the owner of the company. And I was like, man, I had this, but here's the thing, folks. God placed that person in power over you. God doesn't make, God doesn't make any mistakes. He doesn't. And again, I'm not talking about if a boss makes you do something illegal, immoral, or illegal, or unethical, or unbiblical. I'm not talking about that. But again, Paul's writing to young Timothy because this was a huge issue. And he says this in 1 Timothy uh, 6, 1. Let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that at the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. See, here, here's the thing. 
In Ephesus, you, some slaves, we've got proof, were actually elders in the church. They were teaching and their bosses were sitting under their teaching. And so imagine this paradigm, this paradox where a slave is leading in a church, but he's still a slave to his master. And again, I get these words sound, sound offensive, but again, you, we have got to understand the context of the Roman empire and what it was. It is, again, it's, I'm gonna say it probably five more times. It is unlike anything we've seen in our context from the last 200 years. And again, there must have been some contempt because we hear in the very next verse where Paul says to Timothy, those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground they are brothers. So again, Paul's addressing this. He's addressing it. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good and service are believers and beloved. But Nathan, you don't understand my boss. I mean, you just don't understand, man. She doesn't understand me. She's mean. She makes me work all the overtime. Man, he makes me do this. He makes me do that. I don't understand the decisions he makes. Okay, all right. Let's just see what the scriptures have to say about that, shall we? Let's see what Peter says. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. I'm just gonna pause for a moment. This is right after Peter says to honor the emperor. The emperor, most theologians agree, was Nero, who was crucifying Christians left, right, and sideways. Just FYI. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. And then he says this. Again, the apostles were always practical, always. For what credit is it? If when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And then he says this, and it's beautiful. And it comes all, Peter brings it full circle in verse 21. For to this you have been called. Again, Peter's not mincing words, y'all. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. And then again, Paul apply, or excuse me, Peter applies it. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And then Peter echoes out a beautiful fact that we all should focus on. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Yeah, absolutely. By his wounds, you've been healed. Folks, listen, when Jesus was on that cross, every person in here, I'm convinced, and I can't explain it, and I can't back it up by scripture, I can't, but I'm convinced that three hours of judgment that we talk about in communion, I'm convinced that he said, Nathan, or God, forgive Nathan for this, 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 and this, and all my sins were put onto Jesus Christ, all of them. He did that for me, and I would have been there shouting, crucify him. I would have spit on him, and so would you. And he died for us. And he became sin for us. And then he rose from the dead and he conquered death, sin, hell, and the grave for us, for our sake. That's why we obey our bosses. That's why. It's got nothing to do with our bosses. It's got nothing to do with them. This is the whole why behind the submission, y'all. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. And here's the thing. You don't just obey and respect him with lip service. Listen, you be sincere in your respect. Paul says this with a sincere heart as you would Christ. And here's the thing, it's identical to what he says uh, to, to the wives. Submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. It ain't, it ain't for your husband's sake, it's for your worship to the Lord. Husbands, you love your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It ain't got nothing to do with her. It don't matter what she does. Are you in Christ? Are you God's kid? Because if you're not, none of this makes sense. None of it. Here's the thing. Subordination should have no place amongst a Christ follower, period. And listen, I could write a book on it. I had a horrible attitude in the corporate world, whether my boss was the owner or the VP of sales at a larger company. I was like, I can do my job better than him. I can do my job better than her. They don't know what they're talking about. Man, they're making all this money. Yeah, they're also the one who took all the risk. 
Here's the thing. We don't be sincere because we think our boss has earned our sincere respect because Christ demands it. That's why. But Nathan, it's hard for me. I, I, I get it. It's hard for me. God, listen, and I'm not going to go into detail, but God absolutely humiliated me in the corporate world one time. Cost me and my wife tens of thousands of dollars and absolutely humiliated me because of my struggle with pride. I mean, humiliated. You can't even imagine how bad it was. I, I cried like crazy over it. I got so angry and mad, but it was, it was 100% my fault. It was my pride. And folks, we got to get rid of this. And here's the thing. Paul doesn't stop there, does he? There's several more sentences. Serve faithfully. The very next verse, he says, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. You've heard the saying, when the mice or when the cat's away, mice will play. They did a study uh, with privately owned businesses. And when the owners were away on a trip was the lowest productivity and the highest quality control issues when they were away. I'll never forget, I was probably 28, 29, and I had a QC manager at work for me, and he was probably in his mid-50s, and he couldn't stand me because I was so young. And I admit, I, admit I, wasn't probably, I probably wasn't too respectful to him either. But he came up to me one time, and he says, hey, uh, he called me boss boy. That's what he called me. He didn't call me boss man. He called me boss boy. Um, I ended up firing him, but anyway. Um, <laughs> he says, hey, I just wanna let you know something. I was like, what? He said, 501 Friday afternoon, my front bumper's gonna be hitting your rear bumper on the way out of here, buddy. I'm gonna be here one minute after you. I'm gone as soon as you're gone. And here's the thing, isn't that how employees like to be? How are you serving when the cat is away? How? How are you doing? Are you still doing it? When the owner's gone, when the owner's on a vacation, how are you acting at your job? Are you doing it for the glory of the Lord? Here's the thing, folks, we will give an account for this. And again, you're not doing it for your employer. Jesus, Jesus echoes this like crazy. He's preaching a massive sermon to his, uh, to his closest followers. And, and there's, he's on this mountain and people are listening to him. And it picks up in Matthew 6 and in verse 1 he says this, beware. And that Greek there, it's you, you, you better. Fear and trembling right here. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven. And then he gives three practical examples. And I, I was like, well, man, for Tom's sake, no, no, I feel like I, we need to read these. In the very next verse, thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees it in secret will reward you. And then Jesus gives another one on prayer. Prayer was a massive issue because the Pharisees wanted to do all these crazy solemn prayers and be noticed and that's when he says this. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. You desire to have the center of attention? Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And then Jesus talks about fasting. And when you fast, here's what the Pharisees would do, just so y'all know contextually. They put ashes on their face and look all droopy so that they could get uh, sympathy. And people think, oh my goodness, they're such a, uh, revered, you know, Christ or uh, Jew. Man, this is amazing. He says, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. What are you doing in secret? When no one else is looking, how are you acting in your life? How am I acting in my life? When no one else is looking, when you're at your workplace and you know nobody's watching, are you sitting? Listen, if you've got all your work done, pick up a broom. Clean, clean trash, clean the windows. You know why? Not got anything to do with the company. 
It's got nothing to do with your boss. It's got to do with the fact is, are you in Christ? Again, folks, <laughs> we're not just saved to escape hell. The whole of scripture is supposed to completely encapsulate 168 hours a week of our lives to the glory of God. That's what it's supposed to do. Otherwise, you're just taking advantage of your employer and you're not bringing glory to God. Even if your employer doesn't notice or doesn't even care, it doesn't matter. Your father who sees in secret cares, period. Lastly, cheerfully do my job. He says in verse seven, rendering service with a good will, ask to the Lord and not to man. From the heart. Listen, Christians should be the most joyful people on the planet. Guess what time of the week waiters and waitresses dread to wait on tables? It is Sunday at lunch. Do you know how much that grieves our Father in heaven on how horrible the testimony we're given to Jesus Christ and him crucified? We should be the most cheerful people on the planet. Goodness sakes, my sins are washed away. How in the world can I not be cheerful? I heard one story, and unfortunately, it kind of applies to me. One theologian put it like this. A little boy asked his mom, hey, mommy, uh, why do all the morons come out when daddy's driving? <laughs> I mean, and we should be the most morale-building people at work of anybody. And, and, and listen, Paul writes this to call us. Again, Paul, is, he's constant through this. Look what he writes in Colossians. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. When you're gossiping about your boss to other employees, are you doing that in the name of Jesus? Uh-oh. Think about it. Do you pour gasoline on a fire or do you pour water on it and quench it out? I'm just saying, he says in, in um, verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. One theologian put it this way. He was going through Europe back in the 19th century and they were building a huge cathedral. And all these workers are out there. And he goes to the first worker and says, hey, what are you doing? I'm chipping at rocks. And he was chipping the rocks for the foundation. He goes to the next person, they say, I'm just earning a paycheck. He goes to the last person, and they're, and they're happy. And they say, man, I'm helping build a massive, beautiful cathedral. It's all about your perspective. It's all about your perspective. And folks, again, it is because of our love for the, for the Lord of the universe. That's what it's for. How is your attitude at work? Paul writes to young Titus. He says the same thing. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of our God and Savior. Wow. Do you adorn the doctrines of God? If you do, does your, do your actions show it? And then he ends to the bond servants by saying this in verse eight, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Again, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. And again, it's not legalism, it's scriptural. We will be rewarded for our works. They are not, they do not lead to salvation. They do not. They are evidence of your salvation, period. They are. Scripture could not be any more clear about it. Paul then echoes out what would have been an un- Believably countercultural. It, it wouldn't have been quite as uh, husbands love your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for. But it, it, would have, it would have carried with it some massive questions by the church. And he says this, masters, <laughs> do the same to them. Everything we just talked about, bosses, employers, owners, you're to do the same thing to your employees. I, wow. Wow. Listen, employers, I'm gonna talk to y'all now. And listen, <laughs> I, there's a reason Jesus talks about money so much. There's a reason James says the things he says, okay? Man, are, are you just worried about the buck? Is it consuming you? Is it your idol? Because here's the thing, it's nothing. It is nothing eternally, nothing. There's not enough money. 
Paul says that everything we just learned for slaves, he now talks to the, the masters or the employers. And again, this goes back to 521, submitting to one another out of reverence. Remember, what does that, what's that Greek word mean? Come on. What does that Greek word mean right here? Fear. Someone said it. Thank you. Someone's paying attention and remembers. Fear. Do you have a healthy, reverent fear of God? And again, if you fear God, you'll fear nothing else. And if you don't fear God, you'll fear everything else. You'll fear the economy. You'll fear politics. You'll fear social stuff that's going on. You'll fear it all. You'll fear the feds raising interest rates. God, yeah, come on. We're talking about the God of the universe here. The God of the universe. You put on sunscreen to keep from getting sunburn from a star that's 93 million miles away, but you're just going to nonchalantly address the one who created that star? Does that make any sense? It doesn't. So then he says in, in, in the second part of verse nine, stop your threatening. And here's the funny part. <laughs> the, the Greek here, it, it carries the connotation of, of, of loosening up. Loosen, loosen up a little. Are you so strict with your employees that, they, that they're in fear around you? I've had those kind of people before. I have. Are you, are, do you try to help them? Listen, are they, are they asking any questions about Jesus? Because of you, are they not caring about Jesus? Again, it's a huge responsibility that employers, bosses, supervisors, and owners have. It's a massive responsibility for which you will give an account to Jesus Christ and him crucified at judgment day. You will, knowing that he who is both their master, capital M, and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Okay, so this is, this is an amazing statement here. Because again, this would have been so counter-cultural. And it's really of the same vein as when the apostolic church was growing in the apostolic era. And then Peter, Peter the Rock, he, he goes and he goes to the Gentiles. And he sees evidence that God has brought the Gentile nation into the ecclesia. And he's shocked by it. And literally, go back to Jerusalem to, to have a council on it. And so Peter speaks up and he says this because no one could believe it. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand. God shows no partiality, but in every nation. Now here's the deal. <laughs> Anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Well, Nathan, that seems like it's legalistic. No, no, no. Because when you're saved, you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit sanctifies you to look more and more and more like Jesus Christ. This evidence that's what Peter's talking about here. Here's the thing, contextually, the collapse of Rome, the collapse of slavery. was because of what's written in this book. Because God shows no partiality. And here's the thing, you look at the, at the demonic and, and horrible practices that happened in our nation uh, several, a couple hundred years ago. Listen, there was mighty preaching like John Wesley and George Whitfield, and their preaching started a revival. Excuse me, not their preaching, God using them. Started a revival in America, and statesmen who were strong Christ followers, like William Wilberforce and, and William Pitt, that started to stand on the tenets of God. That's what ended slavery here in America. The question is, what, 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 what's your witness? I wish the church would have done more then. I do, because God shows no partiality. There, he doesn't. He shows no partiality. You're either in Christ, and if you're in Christ, you're a son or daughter, period. Or you're not in Christ, and you're not his son and daughter. You're a child of the devil, and you're condemned to hell forever. It's that simple. And we don't shy away from that here at Hendersonville Church. You're either God's kid, or you're not God's kid. Please start asking yourself that. And so we got this, this healthy, Christian employees and employers must honor one another, show respect to each other positionally, show respect to each other spiritually. So positionally, if I've got a boss, yeah, I may be one of the elders here, but if I've got a boss and, and, I'm, and, and he or she's my boss, I've, I've got to submit to them and never use this position to try to usurp authority over there, Period. Show respect to each other spiritually. It's all leveled for the cross. 
every person, every single person, and understand all Christ followers are equal eternally. And listen, he's only asking us to do what Jesus did. I know uh, a couple of semesters ago, the, uh, the women's group went through uh, Philippians. And I've talked about this before. Philippians 2 is one of, my, one of my favorite, the first 11 verses. It's basically termed the humiliation and exaltation of Christ. But Paul's right in the church of Philippi, and he tells us how this happens easily. Excuse me, simply, not easily. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Everybody hates that word now, don't we? We hate it. No one wants to be humble. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Listen, a Christian employee should look so much different. Should be the highest valued employee at that firm, at that company, at that shop. Not because of, of their talents or, or what they're able to do, but because of their character. There's something different about that person. Man, oh man. It's where people start asking them, what's, what's the reason? What's the reason for your faith? What's the reason for you being humble? What's the reason for you to allow that employer to talk to you that way and just say, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir? God placed them in authority over you. It's not about you. It's never been about you. It is about Jesus Christ and him crucified. And again, and I know it, I'm going to get some care cards or an email or a phone call. The more I fight for my individual freedom or my individual privilege or my individual right, the less I look like Jesus Christ. We've got to wake up. We've got to. And so I want, knowing that is who, I want to come back to this. Their master and yours is in heaven. Who's your master? Who, who's your master? Do you have a master? I got no one's master over me. I do what I want to do. Good luck. Good luck at judgment day. Good luck. Because if you have an attitude like that, you won't be at the same judgment day I'm going to be at. You won't. Folks, here's the thing. January 1st, 1863, one of the greatest documents was signed by our government called the Emancipation Proclamation. Okay, it freed slaves. Consequently, you know what the first sentence is? On this day in our Lord. They put everything back to Jesus. Now, I know we ain't got a government like that now. I get it. But here's the thing. My point for that is, is that there were many areas where that proclamation didn't make it to. So consequently, people were, were enslaved for up to three decades later because they didn't know it had been done. Do you know you've been freed? Do you know you've been freed? Are you God's kid? Are you God's kid? People say, Nathan, man, you know, you, you get all, you know, agitated and scratch your head and you go crazy and you sweat and you got in here, there's an ice box in here, you can hang meat in here. Man, what's going on? Do you realize this may be the last time I give a sermon? Do you realize that? Do you realize this may be the last sermon you ever hear? And we all nod our heads. And I'll say, that's right. You could walk out there and get in that parking lot and drop dead of a heart attack and then comes the judgment. Do you really want to play Russian roulette like that? Are you God's kid? Because if you're not God's kid, none of this works. And your life will never be fulfilled. You'll never have joy. You'll never have peace. You'll have a hole. You'll try to fill it with drugs or alcohol or money or something else and you'll never fill it. You never will. And then when you fill it with Christ, oh, and man, my life, man, it gets hard. It gets hard. Man, it does. I mean, we've got tons of just poopy health issues in my family. My wife's got blood cancer. My, my kid, two of my kids have had a bunch of open heart surgeries and she's got an appointment and then my daughter's got an echo and my son, they're going to, you know, he's got an appointment coming up. Hey, this place, man, it's hard. I got a joy and peace. I got a joy and peace. You know what? Nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing. Nothing. Are you God's kid? That's the only question with which you must deal right now. Because again, this may be the last time I ever preach, may be the last time you ever hear the preaching of God's word. 
Are you God's kid? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, it's, it, <laughs> the past several weeks have been tough, God. I, I've cried in my study. Uh, you've convicted me of my, my lack of, of glorifying you being a husband, my lack of glorifying you as a parent. And now, God, you're bringing all these past uh, wrongs that I've done. And God, I mean, I, <laughs> you call us to repentance, God. There can be no remission of sins without repentance. God, there can't be. It's not just praying a prayer, God. It's not just believing. The demons believe. They came and fell down before Jesus and said, what will you do with the son of the most high God? Please don't cast us into the abyss. God, it's faith. And praise your holy name. The faith comes from you too. God, it's amazing you had Paul right about this submission. You, talk, you talked about marriage, which outside of our relationship to you, God, is it's our spouse. And then, God, you talk about the family, the parents and kids. And then, God, you talk about the workplace. But, God, what's so consistent in all your teachings is they revolve around Jesus Christ and him crucified. For our sake, you made him to be sin, who knew no sin. God, so that when we're in him, we don't receive anything. God, we are changed. We are reborn. We are regenerated. God, you don't just wipe the slate clean. God, it's a new slate. We become your righteousness. Thank you for that, God. God, I, I, I beg you that you'll use these upcoming events. God, I beg you uh, that, that you, will, you will convict us to get in your word and not listen. I mean, there's times I listen to podcasts when I'm driving or when I'm doing something. God, that's not, uh, that's not anything necessarily bad. But God, that's not your intention primarily. Your intention primarily is that we jump in your word. God, that's how you speak to us. God, I pray you're speaking to somebody right now that is working out their salvation with fear and trembling. And God, I don't care if this is their first day in church or God, if they've been going to church for six decades. God, thank you for what your words taught us. God, be with us throughout this week. It's not just this one hour, it's the other 167 hours as well this week. Thank you for your word, because that's the only truth we have. It's the only thing on which we can base our lives, God. It's the only thing is your word. And continue to move and continue to sanctify us to look more and more and more like your son. We pray all this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.